Welcome back, everyone. Right now is uh, on stage Nicolo Valigi with his talk, uh, Silicon Valley Code Interview. Please enjoy. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for. Uh, my name is Nico, and today's talk uh, is going to be about the Silicon Valley Coding Interview. When I say Silicon Valley, I mean the tech ecosystem center, say, around San Francisco and includes many of the biggest tech companies in the world, including Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, and so on. It turns out that the Silicon Valley that has produced companies has also developed a kind of a peculiar way to interview people in jobs. And this presentation today tried to show you how these interviews work. I'm decided to give this talk uh, because I've interviewed as a candidate uh, several times in Europe and also in the US. And I was blown away by how different the job interview process was in Europe uh, compared to Silicon Valley. As we'll see throughout the talk, uh, Silicon Valley interviews are known to be extremely technical uh, to the point that some people uh, think that they're so dumb and useless. Uh, this tweet is like a typical point of view. I'm an extremely famous programmer. I guess to the extent that programmers can be famous, uh, which I guess is not a lot, um, created the Brew package manager for Mac, uh, which I guess pretty much anyone in this room that uses a Mac is about. And the tweet complains about being rejected for a job at Google uh, because his data wasn't super sharp, uh, even though I, he created a super successful piece of software uh, used by thousands of people. In general, um, uh, many the type of problems uh, tech uses for interviews have little to do with like the day-to-day -day job candidates will actually have to do. So the fact is, I'm not a recruiter, and I'm programming more than I do philosophy. So we'll just ignore this point of view and just go ahead and do the interviews themselves. Um, I'll about what this talk is going to be for in the next forty-five minutes. Uh, of course, uh, applying to one of the big tech companies uh, like Google or Amazon, uh, you should keep listening. Uh, their interviews are all pretty much the same, and they all pretty much like the problems uh, we're gonna see in the talk. Or maybe uh, you just wanna laugh about how ridiculous these things are, since nobody should care about graphs and sorting and stuff like that once they're done in college. Uh, finally, maybe you're just we just like scored puzzles. Aside, uh, uh, this talk. Uh, sorry, Nicolò. See, yeah. We have uh, some audio issues. There is some clicking uh, in the audio. Or, uh, what's, the, what's the problem? Sorry. Uh, it's clipping. Uh, we can't hear uh, you very well. Okay. okay, so I'm gonna reduce the volume, I guess, right? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Give me a second. Um, let me see. I should be able to reduce the input volume. OK. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, much better. Thank okay. you. Sorry. Sorry. Let me start it again. OK. All good again on the screen? Yes. Um, and uh, some uh, this talk uh, will not make you an algorithm and will not uh, lend you a job at Google tomorrow. So, by the way, uh, you will not uh, learn anything about here. So if you don't like naked for loops, uh, you might want to log off now uh, before I start giving. Yeah, again? Yeah, look, it yeah, looks like uh, maybe it's a better reception. You are using a wireless microphone. The... Oh, yes, I'm using the airport. Is it cutting out? Yeah. Um, Maybe you are too far away from okay. the computer. I'm like two feet, but I can move closer in a second. I don't know. Uh, you know computers, right? Yeah. Uh, is it better now? Try. Uh, I, I'm like, yeah, half a meter away, so it should be good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now okay, it's better, better. OK, thank you. Um, and yeah, so here's what we're going to cover. Uh, OK, screen is still good. Here's what we're going to cover. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the logistics of the interview first, uh, from like say the beginning to the potential job offer. 
Uh, then we're going to spend most of the time on the actual programming problems uh, that are often asked, and then see examples for each uh, family of algorithms. Um, and finally, I'll share some tips for actually preparing for the interview, should you want to do one. Um, just to whet your appetite first, uh, these are examples of real questions uh, I got during interviews, and we're going to see like 10 uh, questions like this during the talk. Um, the first one is uh, you're giving an array of numbers uh, and, a, and, a, and another number. And then the task is to write code uh, to find the number of triplets from the array, A, B, C, uh, such that their sum is less than the given number. And uh, I mean, I'm going to leave you a few seconds to think about it. Uh, so you get like a, a big array of numbers, and then you're going to find, you have to find the number of triplets. Um, under that condition on the sum. And of course, there's a trivial solution here um, where you can basically just check all possible triplets from the array and just return the number of triplets that satisfy the condition. And this works, um, but if you want to do well, um, you'll want to do better than that by implementing a faster algorithm. And we'll see later what that means. Uh, the second example uh, is about implementing a class uh, for a tic-tac-toe game, um, which might seem easy at first glance, but has a bunch of interesting edge cases. So uh, before we actually dig into the programming questions, um, I wanted to give you like a quick overview of the recruiting process from start to finish. Um, depending on how big the company is or how desperate you are or they are, uh, the whole process might take anywhere from a few weeks uh, to a few months. Um, so to start, you either get a call from a recruiter or decide to call one yourself out of the blue, maybe on LinkedIn and stuff like that. Um, referrals from people who already work where you want to go working are also great, uh, as they can get you noticed faster. And the call with the recruiter, assuming they call you back, of course, uh, is short and like non-technical. Um, it's mostly about learning if there's like a role for you at the company and things like that. Uh, then you start talking with your potential team members for technical evaluation. The first round is on the phone, uh, and you're going to be coding uh, with some kind of online ID uh, like CoderFed.io, where you can write code on the browser, compile it on the browser, and so on. Um, if you pass this first stage, uh, you're going to be invited to the office for a whole day. So at least that's how things were before COVID. Um, I hear that many companies are doing both uh, stages now. Uh, and in any case, you're going to be talking to four or five engineers. And each of those one hour uh, interview sessions is going to be about one or two problems. And then at the end of the day, you just go back home and like you crash on the sofa because you're uh, so tired and like stressed out. And after a few weeks, a uh, few days to a few weeks, uh, you hear back from the recruiter uh, who's going to tell you if you're getting an offer, if you pass the interview or not. And uh, that's it for logistics. Uh, the rest of the talk is about the questions them themselves, so actual coding. So uh, when interviewing at Big Tech, uh, most interview questions are going to be about algorithms and data structures. And they're going to be quite abstract. So they're going to be talking about arrays and integers and numbers and stuff like that, and not specific problems that you see in your day-to-day -day job. And in 99% of the cases, uh, the goal of these questions is to see how you apply computer science concepts to problems. So if you uh, find the right data structure and approach, then all these problems can be basically coded up in 20 minutes, either on a IDE or actually on the whiteboard just writing by hand. If you don't find the right abstraction or the right idea, and then you try to invent everything from scratch during that one hour slot, uh, that's going to be very hard. Yeah, and likely, you won't have enough time. And um, yeah, so let's start to break things down. Uh, as you prepare for the interview, uh, it's helpful to divide problems in different categories. And like, yeah, most interviews are going to end up picking problems from like these different categories. Uh, practice is really important. Uh, so you'll be able to tell right away which kind of data structure or uh, solving pattern uh, should be applied for a given problem. And that's going to help you a lot uh, in writing up the solution quickly. So we're going to be using uh, quite a bit of computer science knowledge. And I don't have time, of course, to explain everything in detail. Uh, so I rely on your previous knowledge a bit. 
for each family of algorithms mentioned in the list, we're going to look at an example problem and also try to extract some useful rules of thumb uh, that can generalize this knowledge. Let's start with arrays. Uh, everybody's familiar with arrays. And the main concept about arrays is that L or vectors or what we, you, whatever you want to call them is that elements can be read and modified in constant time, uh, no matter their position within the array, because it's basically random access memory. So this is going to be the simplest problems we see today. And then given an array of integers and a, a target integer, um, the goal is to find a pair of elements such that their sum equals the target number. Uh, and then you can assume that the solution exists and is unique. And below, you can see an example. So the array is like 2, 7, 11, and 15, and the target number is 9. Um, that means the code should return uh, a pair that's 0 and 1, uh, just because the element at index 0 plus the element at index 1 uh, would be 2 and 7 uh, add up to the target number, which is 9. Um, I'm going to leave you like 30 seconds to think about it. And I'm going to be silent. Okay, I wasn't expecting anyone to like write code or like fix it or solve it in 30 seconds. It's just so you get an idea um, about the problem and we're gonna do it for all the problems we see. Um, a trivial solution uh, basically uses a nested loop, right? So we look at all elements and then we, we run an outer loop that looks at all elements. And then for each of those elements, we also look at all other elements in the array. And then we, we take the sum and if the sum actually matches the target number that we want, uh, that means basically we found the right index and the solution is unique, so we can just return. And uh, this works, uh, this code will work, but it will become slow quite quickly if the input array grows bigger because of the nested loop. And it turns out that one of the biggest areas of focus uh, for programming interviews is how you can analyze and improve the performance of the algorithms you design. So let's take a, a brief intermission to discuss what that means. Uh, there's this concept of asymptotic complexity, which measures how quickly the computer workload increases as the size of the input grows. And when I say size of the input, for example, in the previous example, it's just the length of the array, right? Usually each problem has some sort of characteristic dimension uh, that dictates uh, what, what the computer is gonna have to do to solve it. And there's two types of complexity measures. Uh, there's a time measure and a space measure. So time is just about CPU clocks, CPU usage, how much time the CPU is going to be busy. And space is about memory usage. So how much memory we have to allocate to solve the problem. Cost and complexity is kind of the easiest um, and best uh, uh, complexity class, uh, because that's when the time or space taken up by the algorithm uh, don't change uh, no matter how big the input is. So for example, if I ask you to write a program uh, that returns the first element of an array, uh, that's a constant time complexity because the CPU doesn't care how big the array is, it's just gonna do the same operation, just a single operation basically in like a bit abstract terms. Uh, linear complexity is like one notch up. So this is kind of worse algorithms from the performance point of view. Uh, and that's when the space or time requirements uh, grow at the same rate as the size of the input. And an example of this would be if I ask you to sum up all of the elements in the array. Uh, you have to go through each element exactly once and then do some uh, CPU operations like add. Uh, so the complexity turns out to be linear because it grows at the same rate. Uh, quadratic, as the name says, it's when a twofold increase in the input size uh, causes a fourfold increase in the time or space requirement. And typically that's the case if you have a nested loop somewhere, um, just because for each element, you have to go through all the other elements and that turns out to basically increase fourfold. Um, what happens often in interviews is that you come up with an algorithm that works like we did in the previous slide. 
And then the interviewer asks you to define its complexity. Uh, they may also ask you to come up with a better algorithm uh, that has lower complexity, either in time or space or both. And this is important for the kind of like big data sets, uh, lots of computers uh, and problem sizes that are used in big tech. Uh, think about a Google search or something like that. Uh, the difference between like a linear algorithm and a quadratic algorithm uh, could mean basically eternity there. And now that we have some terminology, uh, we can go back to the problem. I'm going to start you start by asking basically what's the time and space complexity of this trivial solution with the nested loop. Uh, I think I would have liked to see like a show of hands or something like that. I think this is like too overhead, uh, too much overhead remotely. So I'm just going to wait a few seconds and tell you that this is, as we were saying, this, is gonna, this was a quadratic solution. Uh, because we're basically looping over uh, the nested loop and like looking at all the elements twice. And the natural follow-up question is, uh, can we write a better solution? And the one I have here is, uh, if we take advantage of extra memory, uh, we can define a, um, like another order map, whatever you want to call it, a Nash table, a dictionary. And these dictionaries have the property that we can look up any value at in constant time. So it doesn't matter how big, at that first approximation, it doesn't matter how big uh, the edge table is, uh, we can look up a key in constant time. Um, which means that it's interesting because we can trade off uh, better time complexity. So an algorithm that runs faster at the ex expense of having a worse space complexity. So we're taking up memory for the edge map but we're now down to a linear time complexity. And that's how we do it. Um, we basically, every time we go through an element, uh, we also store uh, basically its value. Uh, we, in the dictionary, we store a mapping from its value and its index. And then as we traverse to the array, we can easily look up in constant time uh, whether, uh, whether there's a matching element that has the remaining uh, target value that we need uh, to solve the problem. And then whenever we find it, we can just basically return it. And so this is an example of how you can take a trivial algorithm that solves the problem, but it's pretty bad from a complexity perspective, and then turn it on an uh, algorithm with different trade-offs, in this case, faster runtime, but higher memory consumption. Um, OK, so that's it for this family of algorithms. And uh, now we're going to look at stacks, another common uh, family of algorithms that pop up all the time. And um, I assume you kind of know what they are. It's like it's the prototypical first in, first out data structure uh, where you can push elements and then you keep pu uh, pushing elements to something that actually resembles a stack. And then you can pop elements. And uh, the last elements that you pushed is also the first one that's going to be popped. Um, and we have an example problem here too. Um, which works with Unix path names, right? So basically directory paths. And uh, different strings, basically different paths, can represent the same directory or file on disk. Uh, because you can have like these sort of artificial things. You can have dot dot that basically tells you go back to the parent. You can have a single dot that basically means nothing. And you can also have something like nothing, where you have like two slashes, one of the other. And that also doesn't mean anything. It's as if there were a single slash. So the, the goal of the problem here is to basically take the, the string on the left and normalize it to a string on the right so that, so that it's the shortest possible uh, with the same, that points to the same director, that has the same meaning. And um, I'm also going to leave you 30 seconds now uh, to think about the problem and what you would do to solve it. And I mean, of course, telling you it's a stack also helps you quite a bit. OK, uh, the core idea here is that uh, we go through each fragment of the path, basically separated by a slash, and uh, which basically means as, as we find uh, sort of new directories, we push them to the stack. 
And then every time there's a dot dot, that means we have to go back to the parent directory. Uh, and then we, we, that means we basically pop an element from the stack uh, so that we can go back to the parent directory. Uh, and that's how it's implemented. It's a bit more complex than what I just said uh, because there's a bunch of edge cases. Uh, but still, we're basically splitting up the original path uh, based on the slashes. And that, that's the core of the while loop. And then we, we ignore a single dot and then an empty fragment, because those don't mean anything, as I said. And, uh, and then if we have a dot dot, that's when we actually pop, unless there's a bunch of edge cases, right? So if you have a dot dot at the beginning of the path, then you can't really take it out. You have to leave it there and push it to the stack, and it's going to be there in the final output. And so if it's not a single dot, it's not empty, and it's not a dot dot, uh, we push it to the stack, basically. So we, we incrementally build the, the final solution. And now that we have the stack together, so now the stack is going to have all the fragments. Uh, uh, the stack is going to have all the fragments, basically. And now we can basically assemble the result uh, back together by popping each element from the stack uh, incrementally. And um, this is, um, yeah, uh, stacks are good for problems that can be solved um, basically incrementally or also sequentially in the sense that, for example, in this case, we're going through the patterns each by uh, one by one. And then we're sort of keeping an invariant, keeping a condition where the, the, the stack contains the fragments we actually want to keep. Uh, and then if you have a problem that uses a stack, uh, and then you recognize that early on, uh, that's great because it's going to make your life uh, so much simpler. And that's it for stacks. Uh, we're going to move on to trees, which is another bit of programming interviews. And um, this is like a bit more complex data structure uh, that is based around a node type uh, that basically holds a value of any type. And then um, as pointers to like left and right children. Of course, this is not really nice C or anything, just to give you the idea. Um, and trees are actually really fun to work with uh, because they lead to like lots of elegant recursive algorithms as you basically recur down each level of the tree. Because then, of course, each of these nodes, uh, left and right nodes, is also going to have left and right children and, and stuff like that. And it's a fundamental data structure uh, that's used quite a bit in things like databases and stuff like that. And I mean, in this example and toy code, we would just use a null pointer uh, to say that there's a missing left or right uh, of right child. Um, the problem we're going to look at um, is about determining if a binary tree is symmetric uh, around its root. Um, and I mean, it basically means that if you take the root, that is the first element at the top, uh, and then basically the left and the right halves are going to be mirror images of each other. Uh, you see two examples below. Uh, the one on the left is symmetric because below the one there's a two and a two. And then the four, four, and three, and three are kind of mirror images of each other uh, if you go, if you look at the basically as a middle vertical line. And the example on the right is not symmetric um, because it's basically. Yeah, it's not symmetric because it's not a mirror image and the trees are all messed up with respect to each other. Um, as usual, I'm going to leave you 30 seconds to think about it and think about what the symmetry means in this case. And starting from the root, what it means for its child and to be symmetric. Okay, um, let's keep the trees on uh, so I can give you some intuition about what's going on here. And um, basically, the idea is would be that starting at the root, uh, the first condition we want to check is that the left and the right children of the root is going to have to be the same value, right? If we had two and three, then of course it wouldn't be symmetric, right? So that's the first condition we want to check. And then we want to recursively go down uh, the levels of the tree and go down towards the bottom. And then, but here there's a twist, right? Because we want to swap. Uh, a tree is symmetric, so this two sub 
it's rooted at two are going to be symmetric if the right child of the left two is equal to the left child of the right two, because basically they have to be mirror images, right? And so on. And you can see this condition is satisfied in the, in the left example, because four is the right child of the left two, and there's also a four as the left child of the right two. And that's basically what we're gonna check. And uh, we're gonna go for a recursive solution here because it's very elegant. And um, so we're gonna start basically with a helper function that just looks at the root. So for the root, we have to do something slightly different, right? Because we don't really care about the value of the root. We can have any value as a root and it doesn't matter. It doesn't make an impact on whether the tree is symmetric or not. So we call it down by starting with the two uh, children of the root. And then if they're both empty, uh, then it's fine uh, because it means they're, that's also symmetric if there are no children there. Um, and basically if they're both non-empty, uh, that means we have to check the value first, as I said, right? They have to be both uh, the same value, otherwise it wouldn't apply. If we had two and three, then it wouldn't be symmetric. And that's the first check we do. But then we have this, the twist check. Basically, we're checking the left, um, uh, we're checking the left uh, child of the left tree with the right child of the right tree, and vice versa for the other ones. And that's the nice recursive check. And you can see this keeps uh, calling back into his mirror, and the termination condition is going to be either the, the first if condition when they're both empty, and that's good. If they're both empty, then we can just return true because it's symmetric. And there's another return condition that's going to terminate the recursion. Uh, and that's where one is uh, a null pointer, which means there, there's no node there. But the other one isn't, which means it cannot be symmetric, right? It's the same as the right example, um, as the right example in, in a few slides back. So that's it. I think trees are really fun. And usually it's pretty straightforward uh, if you're dealing with a tree problem, because it just starts right away by saying that you have a tree, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's nice to get an intuition for the recursive structure because once you get that, uh, usually it can, they can, the solution can be written down in just a few lines as we, as we did here. Okay, uh, now on to graph problems. Um, I didn't have enough time uh, to present a lot of stuff, so I just, I'm just doing graph search. Uh, these are also very common questions in interviews. And I think they're also the ones that I find uh, more applicable uh, to day-to-day -day programming tasks that we do. Uh, in our day jobs. Um, in our example problem, uh, we're giving a dictionary of words and a, pair, uh, and a pair of words containing the dictionary, a start and an end word. Uh, the goal is to find the minimum number of transformations uh, to go from the first word in the pair to the second, um, given that for each transformation, we can change at most one letter in each word. And also when we do a transformation, all of the intermediate words have to be in the dictionary. Uh, so there's an example here to make it clearer. So we're starting from hit, and we want to hit cog, and the dictionary is hot, dot, blah, 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 and so on. And the length of the transformation sequence in this case is going to be five, uh, because we can go from hit to hot by changing the second letter from I to O. Uh, and then we can go from hot to dot by changing the first letter from H to D and so on until we get to the, to the final sequence. Um, as usual, I'll leave you the 30 seconds to think about it. And uh, yeah. Nico, while they think about the problem, can you try just to move a little bit closer to the PC? Because- uh, Ah, you want to go uh, even closer? Yeah. 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 It's, it's possible. Yeah. Okay, it's working fine, but sometimes. Uh... Yeah, I think the problem is there's a lot of um, Wi Fi traffic and everything in the building. So, yeah. thank you. Okay, I think it's now as close as possible. Okay. Um, yes, uh, so what's the idea here? Every time you see something that mentions a shortest or shorter path, uh, that's usually a, a good sign. Uh, that a graph is going to be a good representation and also good intuition for solving the problem. So the first component as you try to implement a graph solution uh, is an exploration structure. How do you start from like a node in the graph, in this case, like the start word, 
And how you, do you go about exploring all the possible trajectories that lead you to the, to the end word, to the end node? Uh, in this case, we're using a queue uh, because it gives you like a nice property that we're going to see later. And the, our queue is going to hold candidates for further exploration of the graph. Basically, as we go from one word to another in the dictionary by following a, a permissible transformation. And so we start basically by putting the begin word into the queue and then also keeping track of the transformation sequence that we found. Uh, and then we start popping from the queue. And basically, as we pop, um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to explore from all our, our queue kind of holds our exploration frontier, the sort of nodes we want to explore from right now. And then for until the, the queue is empty, we're basically going to start from any of those. Uh, we're going to pop it out of the queue because we're exploring it now. We're going to also remove it from the dictionary because there's no point in having loops. And um, if we found, so if the word we're actually looking at right now is the N word, that means we're done, right? So this code actually doesn't do anything. It's just the exploration boilerplate. Um, the, really, um, the, the part that needs some work is how we list neighbors and how we push them into the queue for exploration. Uh, so I couldn't fit that in the current slide, but that's the part with the comment and the arrow pointing at it. Uh, so let's go through the next slide. And that's how we generate candidates, basically. Um, so remember that what we want to do here is that we're looking at a word, and we want to find all possible transformations of this word that are also present in the dictionary and also match the single character change rule. Uh, so basically, this is just straight line code. Uh, that goes through all the characters in the word and tries to change them one by one and then sees if the resulting word is in the dictionary. And if it is in the dictionary, then we want to push it to the queue for, uh, for further exploration. And uh, that wraps up our uh, graph problems um, part. And I think the, the tricky part with this is that first you have to recognize them, their graphs, and that's often not obvious. Um, and you want to formalize the problem in terms of nodes and edges, and basically connections. In this case, we had uh, nodes were just words, so you had different words in the dictionary. And then edges uh, were uh, basically connections between one word or another based on a possible transformation or not. And as in this case, nobody's telling you that this is a graph problem, right? The problem was about words, and we sort of laid uh, the graph structure on top of it, just so that we could use familiar algorithms, familiar graph search algorithm. And so once you learn to do this sort of transposition and this layering into the graph structure, um, then you basically just need to become familiar with three or four important graph algorithms, that, and then that's basically it. Then you can apply them over and over again to all graph problems. Um, and these also pop up quite frequently in interviews. OK. Now on to dynamic programming, which is like this weird and magical set of tools that this one I actually never used in real life yet, but it also makes for interesting interview question. Uh, I think this is the harder to understand of all the, the problems I had. Um, and we're giving a list of numbers uh, that represent coin values. And then we're asked, what's the minimum number of coins required to make up a given amount? So for example, you could imagine this would be like a cashier uh, trying to basically make change for a given amount if you give them a bill. Or more interesting, you could say, you could think about it as uh, allocating resources on a given machine, for example, allocating virtual machines on the cloud uh, and stuff like that. Uh, the first intuition here is, uh, first I have an example. Say you want to make a rest of 11, and then you have coins with value 1, 2, and 5. Uh, in this case, the answer would be three because you can use two uh, five coins and plus a one coin, and that's going to do five plus five plus one, which is 11, and you're done. Um, just because I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about it. OK, um, so this problem also has some sort of obvious solution. The problem is this time the obvious solution is wrong. Um, the, the, the first idea I want to ask is that I'm just going to use the bigger coins 
So I'm just gonna use a five and a five and a one. Um, and that works in some cases, but it doesn't work in others. Uh, this is called a greedy approach, which basically means just do the best you can towards the solution. And then at some point when you cannot do that anymore, just try to take the notch down. In this case, use a two. Uh, so for this example, it's work, it, it works, uh, but trust me, it's quite confusing. It, that has, actually doesn't work in the general case. Uh, so that doesn't work and you're gonna be shut down during an interview. And the other straightforward way uh, would be to basically look at all possible conditions of um, combinations of coins uh, and then check if that specific combination sums up to the right value. Uh, but this is really terrible complexity. It's even worse than quadratic because like there's, uh, there's tons of possible combinations and this will also get you shut down during an interview. Uh, yes, and if you, if you say one of either of these two solutions you're probably gonna fail the interview or at least the specific problem. And um, this is the only slide with some math, uh, but I think it's interest interesting just to give you an idea. And the basic idea here is that the structure of the problem is really convenient because once we've made uh, an optimal change, I'm not, once you've given an optimal change uh, for a given amount, we can reuse that solution for smaller problems, which means we can start from the target of the problem, say from 11, and then we can break it down into smaller and smaller problems and then reusing them to save complexity. Uh, so I think we're a bit running out of time, so I'm gonna be quicker than I wanted here. Uh, but the idea is that here we're using X uh, to mean the number of coins needed to make up a certain amount, which is basically the, the question, the, 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 the question we need to answer. And the first formula says something obvious, which is the number of coins we need to make up a certain amount is equal to the number of coins we need for the amount less the value of some coin plus one because we use that same coin. Uh, and that's basically only saying that at some point we're just gonna need one more coin to make that amount. And then we have to solve the problem of uh, making the change for the amount minus the value of the coin. The problem is uh, this formula, it's also useless in practice. And because it's obvious it's useless because we don't know which coin we wanna use to be the last coin. And that's the crucial part. The crucial part is since we don't know the last coin to use, we're just gonna try all of them and then pick the minimum because it's basically the, pick the minimum of this solution over all the possible coins we can use as the last coin. Um, and that's the, that's the crucial part because now we can reuse solutions for a smaller amount because now we're back to solving a problem that's simpler because it's not solving X for amount, it's solving X for amount minus the value of the last coin we used. And then we can basically do this recursively. And uh, yes, this is not really easy to understand. I think it, it took me like a lot of days of thinking the first time I came across stuff like this. Uh, and these are also some of the most hated interview questions and also practice helps a lot here. Um, and then it turns out once you have this intuition, you can code up the solution uh, in, uh, that's gonna be pretty fast in, uh, in basically, yeah, you see the lines of code here. Uh, we're basically filling up a table and we're using an outer loop uh, to solve bigger and bigger problems. So starting from an amount of one to the amount that we want. And then within that, we have a nested loop that's basically, it's an explicit version of the minimum and I could have used uh, like a minimum or whatever from the SDL. Uh, but that's clearer to see the, the time complexity if you have a nested loop instead. And um, yeah, uh, also when implementing stuff like that, you can see there's a bunch of zeros and ones. Uh, so this can be basically a knock by one error uh, nightmare often. Um, and now we're back to the final family of problems. Uh, these are system design problems. Uh, uh, are more open-ended questions higher level questions than the algorithms we have seen, but still very technical. And the more you can refer to specific about the algorithms, uh, the more appreciated your answer is gonna be. And these are usually for more senior candidates. Uh, there's not really a right or wrong answer here. And it's more about talking trade-offs. And usually in big, techs, uh, big tech, you'll see these system design questions are often gonna be about distributed systems, just because these companies have huge amounts of data and huge amounts of machines to process them. Uh, this is a question I actually got in one of my interviews, um, which is about sorting more data that fits in the memory of a single machine. Um, 
And yeah, as you can see, it's very open-ended. It's like, what do we do here? As usual, I'm gonna leave you some time to think. So most of the algorithms that we know for sorting are designed to work within the memory of a single machine, right? They access all the arrays in memory and stuff like that. So what do we do here? Uh, the first idea that comes to mind is just to spill to disk and then sort progressively smaller uh, parts of the data to disk. Uh, but then a good answer would say that like a disk is uh, very much slower than the memory or also slower than accessing the memory of other machines on the network. Um, and so as I was saying, natural solutions for many of the system design problems is how to distribute the computation and the storage across multiple machines. But how do we do that? Um, and that's the, the sort of I, moment where you can sort of show off your knowledge about algorithms as a higher level than just writing up the, the for loops. Um, my first thought was to use merge sort, um, which is a well-known sorting algorithms where that basically breaks down the inputs in like smaller and smaller chunks. And then when you get to a chunk that's small enough that it can be sorted within a single machine, you can just use whatever standard sorting algorithms. And then you put the results back together by sharing them over the network between different machines. And this will work since like a nice fit for a distributed system. Uh, also, it's going to have some sort of communication bottlenecks, latency bottlenecks, and stuff like that. Um, and probably like you would want to also evaluate different sorting algorithms. Uh, maybe it's best to do a quick sort and then uh, spread up the work uh, over different machines. because. Uh, so quick sort is typically faster than merge sort uh, in like a single machine. Is that true for uh, for the distributed setting as well and stuff like that? And um, and finally, uh, you could also be critical about the question itself. This is really open ended. Do we, do we really need to sort all this data in the first place? Maybe we can just shard it across multiple machines and never have to sort it in the first place. Say for example, if you're looking at logs and those logs have a timestamp, they have a date on them. Uh, then basically anytime you need to query logs for a single date, you just go to the machine that's storing logs for that date and you never have to touch any of the other machines as well. Um, and that's gonna be basically break down the problem so that you don't need to solve it anymore uh, because now you don't need to sort across multiple machines at all. Um, yeah, and basically this kind of system design questions uh, they give you an opportunity to like show off your knowledge about uh, architecting bigger systems than just writing code for a single machine. And you have more freedom to basically explore. Um, I wanna wrap it up a bit. Uh, so we covered lots of contents quite fast um, and just wanted to recap the kind of data structures we saw. We saw arrays, stacks, trees, graphs, dynamic programming problems and system design program problems. With the exception of the last one, these are all kind of textbook uh, algorithm applications. I left out a bunch of stuff and some stuff that always comes up is like linked lists and queues, uh, backtracking and recursion, and also searching and sorting variations. Um, I wanna wrap up with some tips. And I think these questions are really fun, uh, but there's also this pressure situation, right? It depends, am I gonna get the job or not? That also makes them not fun. And I was also on the interviewer side a lot. So I think the most important thing I've learned that's, uh, that's quite useful is never forget that the interviewer wants you to do well as well. So they're gonna be happy to have one more uh, person to help on the team. And also if you get hired, uh, that means they don't have to do as many interviews in the future just to grow the team. Um, and also I think being interviewed is also a lot more fun than interviewing. So try to be empathic. Uh, because interviewers tend to use the same questions a lot. Uh, and that's not because we're lazy or anything, it's just because we can then compare different candidates. Um, and that means as a candidate, you might be seeing the question for the first time, but the interviewer might have seen for like 20 times already in the past few months, and that gets quite boring. Um, but it also means that like, of course, it looks like your interviewer is so much smarter than you, but that's because they have seen the question so many times, they just know all the ins and outs. And they've probably seen like 20 solutions and 20 different mistakes from different candidates. Um, and take advantage of that. Um, if you get stuck, uh, it's in your best interest to get unstuck as soon as possible so you can show off your skills. 
Uh, some interviewers will just give you tips without you even asking, and some other will just be silent and leave you to struggle. So don't be afraid to like ask for help if you feel like you're really stuck, because then maybe as you get over this kind of problem, then you can implement and finish up the problem and you're still better off um, than you would have been otherwise. And another common suggestion is to start with quick solutions, easy solutions to code up as we did. Uh, so sometimes you're coding on a whiteboard uh, if you're in an office or you might even be coding on a computer. Uh, in any case, if you get a solution done quickly, that gets rid of the stress. And then you can talk and like incrementally improve it from like complexity, make the code clear and stuff like that. Usually being correct and getting all the edge cases right is more important than being fast from the start. So usually try to focus on correctness and try not to skimp on the edge cases because nobody wants a team worker that writes code that has edge cases and breaks down, right? Um, and finally, of course, practice, practice, and some more practice uh, basically helps. Um, the, the goal is to kind of get to the point where you have enough intuition uh, that you can look at a problem, you don't know how to solve it, but you feel like this is you need to use dynamic programming there or you, you need to use a graph search there. Uh, and that intuition is basically going to make it quite faster to, to, solve, to solve things. And I also believe that it's going to make you a better programmer in your day job as you learn to identify these opportunities in your day-to-day -day job as well. Um, finally, uh, I want to close with a few references for further study. Uh, I think the first book is like 500 pages, pretty much anything uh, you would need to learn about from strictly the programming interviews perspective. Uh, they also have like a, on github.com, if you click on the PDF, there's going to be a link to their uh, code repository where they have uh, test cases for like hundreds of problems in the book. And that's really amazing. You can get from coding to running the test cases in like t uh, 30 seconds. It's amazing. Uh, saves a lot of time. There's tons of sites with like tons of interview questions. Uh, I like lead code because it's good test cases as well. And they also have pretty active forums where people share uh potential solutions so you can learn new tricks and for a more academic but still very practical introduction uh i like the scanner manual and uh, goes into more detail not so much about how to solve problems like this but uh, gives you an intuition about the data structures some of the stacks and cues that we saw and a lot about graph algorithms uh, more in detail than like a book about programming interviews would and that's it. Uh, so thanks a lot for your time and any questions. Uh, Thank you very how much. How are you going to do questions? Should I read questions or you're going to tell me questions? Uh, let's see. There is just there any questions, first one of question. Uh, why not using Modulo? But I don't know to what it refers. Uh, uh, I don't remember which one might be. Give me a second. Maybe about the system design part uh, system design part how would you do it in Modulo? yeah uh, i mean yeah that that was kind of the idea of merging stuff i guess the idea would be to split up uh data but then you still need to merge it at some point right so i guess using a module would be i use a module to split it up and then i merge it on each machine and then i merge it back together um, but still you're doing like tons of uh, i'm not sure i mean of course i never got the right questions uh, in quotes uh, but um, merge sort might not be the best thing because you're doing like lots of uh, transfers within the network at each individual step. Uh, so I'm not sure. And also you need to store all the data somewhere. So I'm not even sure it's the, the best solution. That's why it's really open-ended. Also, the idea wasn't as much to give right solutions to any of these problems. Actually, I think uh, many of these are not like the 100% best solution. Uh, just to give you an idea of the uh, kind of problems you might have to face if you decide to interview at Google or something like that. Okay, we have uh, time for another question. What about behavioral questions? Did they play a big role in your case? Mm, usually it's something kind of separate. I didn't, so uh, I, in my experience, I only get them like once or twice. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think you're gonna fail this really if you're like a decent human being. I feel like there's like, I think what they, I mean, my understanding is they try to sort of meet a bar. Like would this person be like a good employee, would be like a good team member and stuff like that. And I don't think they're gonna push you like over the bar or un under the bar if you're like a decent human being. Okay.
Thank you very much for uh, your talk. And uh, okay. we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes for uh, another two talks. And please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Are we good? Oh, no, I'm still uh -huh. on.